So, thank you so much. It's a, really an honor to be here and to attend this fantastic birthday party, and of course also to address such a well-educated audience. It's also a privilege to speak after Dan Smith and, and Margareta Wallström to be on the same panel as these great people who've given us some fantastic talks here today, and I'm so happy because I feel they've set the stage for me in a great way. You've talked about challenges, uh, drivers of risk and conflict around the world, but we've also heard, I think, some positive messages of things moving in the right direction, some at least. Um, in my talk here today, I will not start in the global arena. I will rather move down to the national level and discuss a bit the response of national systems to this changing risk environment that we have talked about. I will be a bit self-critical, and I will ask the question, how well equipped are we really at government level to address this changing risk landscape? Are we on top of things, or are there areas where we do need to improve? That's the question that I'm putting out there. But I will leave it hanging for a little while, because I promised our moderator, Professor Mo Hamza, that I would start by introducing the agency that I'm representing, the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, MSB. Mo has been working with MSB for many years now, providing scientific advice into the work we're doing on disaster risk reduction and capacity building. But he still gets many questions from friends and relatives and people here at university, teachers, students, about this agency, MSB. What is MSB actually doing? Or perhaps not doing, because we do many things. We have a very wide scope of activity. And um, so I... I thought I'd start with this. What is MSB? And uh, MSB was created in 2009, so we've been around for eight years now. And we were established very much in the aftermath of the tsunami that we heard about, that Margareta also talked about, uh, which was one of the most deadliest disasters we've experienced so far. Uh, took 500 Swedish lives, more than 500. So it was a real challenge to Swedish preparedness at the time. And I think for many different reasons, but I think one of the reasons was that we were not mentally prepared then for a scenario where we would have to rescue our own citizens in a country far away. So in that respect, I think the tsunami was a very good example of the kind of really challenging risks that, we have, that we're discussing here today that are in many respects transboundary in their nature and in their scope, in their impact on society. And by transboundary, I mean that they transcend, they run across all these boundaries, geographical, administrative, jurisdictional. We work a lot with such risks at MSP, and we try to reduce their impact on society. And we do this by facilitating cooperation and coordinated action. So this sounds a bit vague, I'm aware of that, but it actually works. And what we do is that we bring together a very wide range of, of stakeholders, and we, uh, we make them sort of share, share the information in a structured way. And they come up with something which is a common operational picture, if you will. We also guide them along the way with knowledge. We provide different kinds of analysis. We also fund excellent research, for example, here at Lund University. We have some money, which usually helps. We have about one billion in Swedish crowns that we allocate for investments in, in different projects on prevention and preparedness. And uh, we can also regulate. This is our least powerful tool. The, the best one is actually knowledge, but we can regulate, and we do that in certain areas, for example, in risk and vulnerability analysis. We use what is often called the whole-of-society approach, which is what Margareta spoke about. This is what is needed. So we work across all levels of government, from the local level, the local municipalities, to the regional and up to the international. We're also operating, we have a very wide risk and threat spectrum. It's called an all-hazards approach. So we deal with everything from the accident to the large-scale events, the natural disasters. 
uh, to a cyber attack, we host the, the national CERT function, the Computer Emergency Response Team of Sweden. We would also deal with the consequences on society of a pandemic, for example, or nasty diseases like Ebola. We were present in Liberia and in Sierra Leone. So we work at home and we work abroad. We do international uh, humanitarian disaster relief, but also long-term, more long-term capacity building, disaster risk reduction, what Mo is helping us with. So we do a lot, and on top of this, we also organize exercises and we provide training. I'm looking at my colleague here from MSP. So we have training colleges in Revinge, close to Lund, and also up in the north of Sweden. So that was MSP quick version, and I'm happy to get back to MSP later on uh, during the Q&A or in the panel discussion. But let me now return to where I started, namely, are we doing a good job at national level? My short answer would be that we are doing many, thing, many things right, but I also want to be honest already now and say that we are struggling a bit with certain areas. One such area that I would like to highlight here is understanding risk, which was also mentioned by you, uh, which is also the first priority in the Sendai framework, I should say. And uh, both Dan and Margareta spoke about the need of having a solid knowledge and evidence base, and I completely agree. And for us, as a government agency, this is particularly important because we deal with taxpayers' money here. So we have to know that what we use them for, our not endless resources, that what we use them for is actually the right things, that we're making the right priorities. If we decide to allocate millions to flood prevention in one part of Sweden, we need to know that this was the right investment. It has to be based on a good risk analysis. We could have invested it in pandemic preparedness, but we chose flood prevention. So we need a solid knowledge base. Fortunately, we are not starting from scratch here. I mean, we've been struggling with this for many years now, building a knowledge base on risk. We have uh, in Sweden a system which is quite unique in Europe, I would say, where we do risk and vulnerability on all levels in society, at the municipality level, the county council, the county administrative boards, all government agencies do risk and vulnerability analysis. And we at MSP, we gather this wealth of information on risks and we add some elements and we provide a national risk assessment that we hand into government and which also goes all the way up to the EU, because uh, we have at EU now, at EU level, something called an EU risk overview of major risks impacting the Union. And this is a merge between 28 member states' national risk assessments. We have at international level, we have the Global Assessment Report provided by the UNISDR. We have the IPCC. There is a wealth of information. We know lots of things, but these risks are slippery bastards. They are moving targets. And I think Mo mentioned in his introduction the interconnectedness. So the, the risks keep changing. So we add a bit of new technology, which changes human behavior. We add some new extreme weather patterns, and we have a whole new range of risk perspectives. Margareta mentioned the Fukushima triple disaster perfect examples of risks interacting, earthquake, tsunami, nuclear disaster. We had in, in 2006, we had a power outage in Europe. It started in Germany, a small glitch, human failure. It spread out to eight member states. Now, the impact wasn't that large. It was quite quickly fixed, but it still illustrates the vulnerability of this interconnected infrastructure. So this is what we're up against. So it's a bit like Sisyphus. So we push the stone up the hill, and it comes down, but in a new shape. So what can we do about this? First thing, build close alliances with our academics. And particularly, I would say, those specialized in the science of complexity and interconnectedness. And I'm really happy, I have Henrik here in front of me, I'm really happy that MSP has now started cooperation with the, the Lund Center for Critical Infrastructure Research, CENSIP. 
So I have very high hopes for, for our cooperation over the coming years. Another key point uh, that I think both Margarete and Dan touched upon is the need for us on the government side to become much more innovative when it comes to engaging with the private sector. This is a topic that has been discussed for many years, ever since I started at MSB, public-private cooperation. I've attended numerous conferences on public-private cooperation, where 95% of the participants are government officials. 5% at best are from private sector. I've even attended one such conference with zero participants from the private sector. So what is the reason for this? Well, I think there is some kind of unease, generally, among government officials to interact with these nasty profit-driven people on the private side. So we prefer to keep them at arm's length. But this isn't working anymore. We can't do this. We need to get our hands a bit dirty. Because these risks that we have out there are so complex, and the private sector, they sit on so much on the critical infrastructure, on so much of the skills, the money, uh, the expertise. So we have to find new ways of, of interacting here. And uh, I was exaggerating a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, there is unease, but I mean, at MSP, we do have public-private cooperation. We have a number of platforms for public-private cooperation. We have one in the financial sector, we have one in the transportation sector, we have on cybersecurity, media preparedness. These are working really well. But my point is that I think we will need to go broader and we will need to work in different ways. And I'm thinking stuff we are already doing, trusted information sharing, working together on standards, for example, very important. But I think we will need to integrate private participant companies, these operators of critical infrastructure, more closely into the core of our planning for prevention and preparedness. One important driver here will be the work we are doing currently on civil defense, because we are now, for the first time since MSV was established, we are also planning for the war. This is a new thing. And uh, within this planning, we are asked to consider a number of very concrete minimum requirements for resilience, also called baselines for resilience in a number of areas, mass evacuation, transportation, energy supply, food supply. So this will be, I think, uh, quite a strong push for us, and it will, it will force us to bridge this mental gap and to actually start building closer alliances with the private sector over the coming years. Before finishing, uh, I also want to touch upon another area where I believe we have some untapped potential and that is in the relationship with our citizens. And this is, of course, very important. Everything that we do to build resilience aims to our citizens. But here I also want to be a bit self-critical again and say that during the Cold War, I think this worked really well. We were quite clear in our instructions and recommendations to citizens how to prepare for the war and how you can contribute. I think a bit of that got lost as we moved into the 90s in this complex, new and wide risk and threat spectrum. The good news, though, is that it's picking up again. And we are seeing at MSP uh, quite a growing interest among the population to act as volunteers to participate during crises and disasters. This is very this is excellent, and this is obviously something we have to encourage. Here I also want to mention a positive development in terms of all this fantastic new technology that has both good and bad sides, but the good sides in terms of, of interacting with citizens is that it definitely makes things very much easier when we have stuff like crowdsourcing, for example. Uh, this has been used in many crises and disasters. We had, for example, 
Haiti already in 2010, uh, crowdsourcing was used to map out where we had uh, people trapped under the rubble to, to be able to redirect resources, medical supplies, search and rescue. We had it during the Ebola crisis um, to map out areas where we had infected patients, but also to spread quite sort of concrete advice on how to avoid becoming infected and what to do if you have somebody who's infected. So good advice and good recommendations. I think this new technology is a bit of a game changer when it comes to uh, citizen resilience and how we're interacting. Before, I know my time is running up, but um, I just want to use this occasion also to make some publicity for a campaign that MSB is launching uh, beginning of May, I think it's the 8th of May, uh, called the Crisis Preparedness Week. We're doing it together with the movers and shakers, all these local municipalities out there in Sweden. And um, the focus is citizen resilience and how you can, first of all, be prepared yourself, but also help your community to get better prepared. It's a really exciting campaign. We have more information, obviously, on our website, msb.se. So where does this take me? What are my conclusions from this talk? Are we coping or not at the national level? Well, I think my answer will be quite modest. Um, if we look at the grading, they keep changing these grading scales all the time, but I think on, in secondary school now it's A to F, with F failed and A being the best. I would give us a strong C, approaching a B perhaps. And we're not quite on top of things, but I, I would still like to point out that we are aware of the challenges and we are working on them. And I think that's a very good start. And that's where I will finish. Thank you.